In the 1950s and later the 70s, there was a major scare among the consumer population about subliminal messaging. The Vickery movie experiment would flash images and ads in a film at 1 300th of a second, and the results came out as having a 15 per and the results came out as having an 18% increase in refreshments sold at that movie theater. Sounds pretty convincing until you find out that it was a hoax by Vickery to sell fake advertising techniques. People got all worked up and experiments were run to find out that there was nothing to it. In 1973, when Wilson Brian Keyes published Subliminal Seduction, he believed that there were hidden sexual messages in advertising to get people to buy stuff. Using fear, he ended up selling a lot of books. Of course, thanks to pareidolia, we can find patterns in anything, even when they weren't put there purposely. Especially things that remind us of sex. Of course, now we have acts and beer commercials, and don't need to bother with subliminal parts. Keyes, however, did get a few things right. He did postulate that if you can control the images of the times and the cultural symbols, your advertising power will increase. An example of this is when the Bush campaign machine paid to have a call-in survey company ask people what words they associated with fear, good, and other emotions, then had Bush use them in his speech. The brain is something that has been forever impossible to read and difficult to manipulate or completely control. Because of this, protecting the privacy and apparent control over our own minds is something we value above all else. From old hypnotism movies to the pod people to the matrix, we have long feared the power of politicians, companies, or aliens affecting our minds. Of course, we are all a little too arrogant in ourselves, believing that we aren't already swayed or manipulated for illogical reasons. A great manipulator can use your emotions and natural biases against you to make you believe something completely illogical and baseless, but you believe it so strongly. Many can also read your micro-expressions. This is how cops interrogate more and more these days, and how fortune tellers have worked for centuries. And of course, atheists and skeptics aren't immune, and though many believe themselves free from this manipulation, many realize their own susceptibility to manipulation and bias and learn tricks and steps to reduce their own manipulability. When you destroy your self-important belief that you cannot be manipulated, you can then begin to work toward creating mental constructs to reduce your susceptibility to suggestion. I suggest watching Here There Be Dragons by Skeptoids Brian Dunning, discussing logical fallacies, and a series Painful Mass did on natural biases that we all have. Links are in the bottom. The future, however, holds a bit more nervousness and uncertainty about mind invasion, requiring a new fight in the future and a new ethics discussion. If you watch my two videos on transhumanism, which I recommend you watch before continuing, reading and upgrading and interfacing with the brain could begin on a wide scale in the next 50 years. This will lead to a lot of legal fights in terms of free speech, advertising, and the abilities to manipulate people and read their private thoughts. How the legal system will protect people from manipulation by both government, hackers, and companies will require a completely different set of laws than we have now. Freedom of speech will not work if shown to directly emotionally overwhelm logic or to alter the neurons beyond the effect of just learning. It could have a wonderful effect where politicians and companies are no longer allowed to use emotion or manipulation to affect how you think. Only art and entertainment will be able to use emotion and nothing will be allowed to manipulate you mentally without your consent or awareness. Emotional manipulation will be something akin to enjoying a beer, like a movie or a magic show, where you know the risk of entertaining an idea and can do with it what you want. Ever since sci-fi was invented, the idea of removing all emotion is something that scared us, but tests done on people with no capabilities for emotion, such as the damage to the amygdala, these people don't have the ability to make a decision because they will keep looking at all possibilities and never decide on anything, so this will be highly unlikely. Emotions are more like food addictions and less like alcohol addictions, and you can't quit them. They just need to be held at a certain level. The problem with emotions is that unlike with alcohol and other drugs, you didn't decide to have that emotion, so you sometimes, without a lot of practice, can't tell if it's the emotion twisting your perception on a situation, or if that situation is actually how you perceive it to be. 
Science is currently working on neuroimagers for personal use that in the next 10 to 20 years might be able to read your emotional and neural activity for you and make you aware of what's going on in your brain. At some point you might be able to access a program that allows you to know how emotionally manipulated you are being by something and not thinking logically. Of course, who controls or provides that software is the question. Private companies where you never know if one group is being selective towards certain products or ideas, corrupt governments that would love to control its citizens, or will it be something of a hybrid? Our current in our current systems, our brains would probably be already mush if the tech was given to the world right now. Remember, utopia is a story to show us what to aim and aspire for. A dystopia is a story of warning of what could happen if we aren't careful and aware enough. The reality will be somewhere in between, varying on gradients from nations to nations. North Korea, Syria, and Belarus are examples of modern near dystopias. Sadly, no one is in a utopia, but depending on your values and ideals, you might believe that you or another's nation is closer to a utopia. However, in the next decade, we're going to face some of these political battles and problems. At the moment, a new trend called neuromarketing is occurring using something similar to the Bush election strategy. By taking neuroimages while people watch scenes, camera angles, cultural symbols, and such, marketers and movie makers are learning how to get the best emotional response to a photo or video scene possible. Something as simple as a camera angle or a difference in lighting, companies could increase your opinion of them without actually changing their message at all. A movie could appear to be phenomenal just because your brain gets a rush off of it, but if you'd look at the script, it might actually be a complete piece of crap insulting your brain. In our current system where children are introduced to commercials at a ridiculously young age, an industry ranking in $50 billion a year on child advertising alone, I don't think people would let the government regulate these ad companies using their own technology. A government could make it illegal to reduce a commercial that causes a certain level of brain activity in certain areas known to override logic. I don't see this happening, especially if people who want to keep things the way they are are in charge of advertising to prevent this from happening. And they will pass it off as anarcho-capitalist free speech because corporations are people. This will become more and more of a problem as our ability to analyze the brain improves, but organizations like Partnership for a Commercial Free Childhood are working on changing the system. In our system where corporations are people and regulation is being torn down, the system is only representative of two parties and education is such a low priority. America is setting itself up to be quite a repressive regime as this technology progresses. Europe and Canada show regulation and restraint over some advertising and will be much more capable of acting faster to change the laws needed. In the future, hackers may be the ones to promote free thinking as this and robotic armies are going to be the major potential dangers or triumphs of the next 50 years. This may very well be one of the reasons why aliens have yet to contact us. In a series of future fiction books I may never get published for 10 years at the rate I'm going, each progressing 50 years into the future, in 150 years we meet the aliens who crashed at Roswell who hid their existence from us, as they had tried generously giving this sort of brain technology to another lesser advanced planet. The tech quickly got into greedy hands and ended up brainwashing the planet, created something similar to the Borg, and was at the point of containing the crisis from spreading beyond three planets it ended up infecting. Just like with a nuclear bomb and many other new technologies, we shall be riding the knife's edge of ensuring that Moore's Law of Ethics keeps up with Moore's Law of Technology. It will be a big nerve-wracking fight, but we shall also see great wonders in our future as we strive toward what humanity could be capable of. P.S. I know what Moore's Law actually is. Watch my videos earlier if you don't know what I'm referring to. It has to do with a uh, concept Dawkins brought up. Thank you.